Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, FFCRA and CARES Acts, What business Businesses Need to Know. My name is Stephanie Matos, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to remind the audience to please feel free to submit questions throughout the event via the Q&A box on your webinar toolbar. Our presenter will be answering questions at the end of this webinar. Any technical questions you may have will be addressed as soon as possible. With the COVID-19 virus's impact on people and businesses growing more serious every day, many companies are left trying to figure out their best options for how to protect their employees, balance business needs, and satisfy client demands. Join our presenter, Claudia St. John, as they help us navigate this, through this tough time. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to pass it over to Claudia St. John. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another uh, episode of the coronavirus uh, fiasco that we're all dealing with. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of an, an overview. Today, we're going to talk about, again, about the family, uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, which we did talk about last week as well. Uh, that recording is also on um, your association's website. Um, today, we're going to still touch a little bit on that. I know a lot of folks uh, have questions about that. We're also going to talk about the CARES Act. We're going to talk in general terms about that. Uh, as with last week, I'm going to do my best to fly through this content in order to get to all of your questions as possible. So my goal, my hope, is not to take more than 30 minutes giving this overview um, and, then, uh, and then take your specific questions as much as I can. Um, again, I'm Claudia St. John. I'm the president of Affinity HR Group. We're, we are your HR resource and partner. And by saying that, I mean that many of the organizations on this uh, call today are affiliated with associations that we're partners with. And as a result, if you're, an, if you're a member of one of those partner associations, or, or even not, um, if you do have questions or need help during this time, that's what we're here to do. We are here to help. <clears throat> we are not attorneys. We are not bankers and we are not accountants. Um, and if you ever saw me do math, you would be certain of that fact. Um, so much of what we talk about in here is from an HR perspective, from an employer's perspective. Nothing we say here really is to, is to intend to provide any kind of legal or financial uh, counsel to you. We really, really recommend that you talk to your own attorneys and your own bankers. I'm gonna reiterate that part point over and over again. Um, when I get to the questions and answers, we'll be sitting on this page for probably about uh, a half an hour, so you'll have my contact information there. But well, one thing I do want to point out, in addition to um, contact at Affinity HR Group and our website, which is at the bottom and our phone number, our website, affinityhrgroup.com, if you do forward slash blog, or if you connect with me on LinkedIn, which I strongly encourage you to do, we're providing um, all of the resources as we develop them, and we're developing resources daily as we go along uh, in this crisis. Um, so please connect with us there to get more information. Of course, your association has a very, very robust uh, coronavirus response page, and I know they are doing a great job of uh, maintaining not only uh, information from an HR perspective, but also from an industry perspective and how different companies in your industry are responding. So uh, lots of different resources available to you. And we will try to continue to do this for you until uh, such a time that we don't actually need to do it um, anymore. <clears throat> I, I've shared this slide a number of times, but it's just worth reiterating. You know, none of us have been through this. None of us know what to expect. We're all going through it for the very first time. Um, and so as we deal with situations, as we deal with uh, accommodating the federal laws that I'm going to talk about here today, but also as you deal with your individual employees, recognize that every situation is unique. So the solutions you come up with to address your employees' concerns and your own business concerns, they're not setting a precedent. We're just rubber banding and bubble gumming our way through this entire process. Um, and that's why I've got my old uh, good old MacGyver's toolkit, emergency toolkit, um, uh, because really what, what you put in place for one person or one situation or one scenario or one week uh, may be different uh, as time goes on. I have to say, um, uh, we've been doing just a, a lot of content and, and answering calls uh, that come in um, all day long, calls and emails, um, which we're happy to do. I'm a little sad because um, about two or three weeks ago, 
those questions were all about um, what do I do? How do I how do I handle this? Then came the Families First Act that uh, required that folks uh, put in place some emergency sick leave and some emergency paid family leave, and that had a lot of questions. Um, and and uh, we responded to those. And then you know we have the CARES Act. Um, yesterday and today were the very first days that we were dealing with employers that actually had COVID showing up in their workplaces. So I guess the last three weeks have been the time for us to prepare for what we're actually going to be facing now. And so I kind of have a heavy heart going into this. And I'm, I'm sorry for those of you that are dealing with this now. And uh, please prepare for those of you who haven't had to deal with it yet because um, it's just no fun. And the way that you prepare now will certainly ease that transition um, should you be so unfortunate as to have um, to deal with COVID in your workplace, in your communities, and, um, and in your families. That said, one final word, and that is how you respond to this. Sorry, I've got an itchy eye. How you respond to this um, is being observed by all of your employees. So everybody's watching you. Um, how you handle it, the level of optimism and support that you show, the level of compassion and care that you show for each and every employee, especially those employees, well, you've got them on both sides. And I can tell you for a fact, no one's happy right now. The folks who are having to go to work right now because they're working in essential businesses and their communities haven't shut down are scared. And they're legitimate, scared, they're legitimate reasons to be scared. So recognize that that's a really tough thing for employees that keep showing up day after day after day in, in light of this crisis. Um, but then, of course, those who are fortunate enough to stay home and feel relatively safe, they worry about the economic hardship that they're going to face as a result of this and how long is it going to go on. And, um, of course, uh, can I survive being in the same house with my children and, and spouses? So all of those are stressors that we're all dealing with. So, so you are the beacon of how to handle it, how to move forward with grace and optimism, but being truthful and being honest with folks. Um, I just want to remind you that oftentimes leaders forget that all eyes are on you and all eyes are on you, especially now. So just a reminder. So getting into the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, this was passed on March 18th, which seems like two years ago. Um, and it has two main provisions. I'm going to go through it in broad terms. We've already put together a lot of material on this. So please check your uh, association website or check out our blog or connect with me on LinkedIn. But the two pieces that the coronavirus, uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act put in place is an Emergency Sick Leave Act. Um, and we're gonna talk about that first. Since that has come out, I wanna tell you, the Department of Labor site that provides guidance on this literally every day adds more questions and answers to how to comply with that act. So um, we're, we're learning more every day. We still have a lot of questions and a lot of unknowns, but a lot of those questions are being answered and I'll, I'll provide some overview of those as I, as I know them. So the first is that uh, both provisions of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act apply to employee, employers with 500 or fewer employees. Those with more than 500 employees are not covered by this act. Basically, the sick leave, the Emergency Sick Leave Act, provides 10 days of paid sick leave to your employees, both full-time and part-time, at their regular rate of pay. So up to 80 hours for full-time employees and a prorated amount for part-time employees based on their regular rate of pay. It's up to $511 or $5,110 maximum per day or over the 10-year period for being tested, being treated, or diagnosed with COVID. So this is being COVID sick or having a strong suspicion of being sick with COVID. Being told by a doctor or government official to stay home due to a potential exposure. Or two thirds of pay up to $200 a day or over the 10 day period, a $2,000 benefit. For those who are home because their kids are in school or their daycares are closed down, or if you have um, a family member that's sick with coronavirus. So all of this is 10 days of sick leave, either because you have coronavirus or suspected or of having coronavirus, you are taking care of somebody who is sick with coronavirus, or you're at home because your kids do not have school. All of this is being paid 
by the federal government. It's getting reimbursed. Let me be clear about that. You're paying it. Employers are paying this benefit, but it is fully reimbursable 100% by the federal government, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, there's also the Families Medical Expansion Act. This is like Families and Medical Leave, except it's for employers, employees with fewer than 500 and it, uh, employees, and it's paid. It's for folks who have fewer than 500 employees, um, and it covers those employees who have worked for you for at least 30 days, they cannot work remotely. The, the nature of their job does not allow them or enable them to work remotely. And they're unable to work because they have to take care of somebody out of school or, or a, a child who's out of school or daycare. So this is only for those who are home taking care of kids because their schools or daycares are closed. Um, the first 10 days of this leave uh, is unpaid. But as I just explained, under the sick leave provision, they can take those 10 days of sick leave to take care of that and then do this. If they become sick with coronavirus first, let's say, and they're under suspicion and they're quarantined for 10 days uh, because of a, a medical directive, then if their school closes down, say four weeks later, the first 10 days would be unpaid, but they can use their own PTO if they have it available. So if they've got sick leave or, or vacation. That's not happening in most instances because schools are pretty much closed across the country. I mean, there's still some states that are still open, but by and large, schools have closed down. Um, it covers two thirds of pay, like the family leave, or the family medical leave, um, the sick leave, sorry, up to $200 a day. Uh, or not to exceed $10,000 for the totality of the 10 weeks um, that it covers. And it also covers any health insurance expenses that are incurred uh, to maintain the individual's health insurance. And health insurance does need to be maintained. So if they had health insurance beforehand, they would maintain that coverage uh, as you would normally do so um, uh, as a result of their leave. So health insurance is included. It's fully reimbursable by the federal government. And the way this is done is that the every quarter, usually quarter, sometimes it's more frequent, employers are paying the federal government social security and payroll taxes that are due on the payroll that they pay, FICA taxes and social security taxes. So for this, they are deducting from what they would normally submit or pay in their federal taxes the amount that they had to pay in order to provide this leave. What I recommend you do is put in your payroll system, your payroll processing system, a code that is specific to be able to identify those on the emergency medical leave and those on the emergency family leave so that you can run your payroll reports, find out how much of that benefit, how much you paid out under that leave, and that is the amount that you would deduct from your payroll tax. Now, what if, you're, what if the, what you're paying out in this leave exceeds what you're paying in payroll tax? You can then apply for a credit uh, for future pay, uh, on future taxes that are owed, or you can get an emergency loan or an emergency cash infusion under the CARES Act. So this is where those two laws are beginning to kind of coordinate uh, with one another. But however you do it, you would go through um, and, and deduct that amount um, uh, in, in, at first. Um, now, for those companies that are, um, well, let me go through a couple of clarifications. It's effective as of today. Happy birthday, uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Anybody who was out on leave before, who was either um, taking care of childcare before or sick before today, is not covered under this. It doesn't mean that you should not cover them. Of course, we want these are, you know, these are crisis situations. So you know, rubber band and bubble gum your way through it, take care of those that need to be taken care of, but that will not be reimbursed by the federal government. It is not covered under this. This starts today and it goes through the end of 2020. So it's not retroactive. It does not cover stay in place orders. There was a lot of confusion about this prior. So if you're in a state like I am where you've been told you are a stay at place, remain in place, and you cannot go to work, you're not an essential business, if you cannot, if those individuals cannot go to work um, or they're, um, they're, they're stuck on, you know, unable 
basically unable to work. I don't know why I need to repeat that twice. Um, as a result of a, a directive by the federal, state, or local level, so a directive, it's not covered by this. Those individuals would be no, if, they're, if you're unable to work, they would go on to unemployment, and we'll talk about that in a minute because that's where the CARES offers an expanded unemployment benefit to supplement businesses that um, cannot work and are not able to, to maintain operations. Um, it is not available to those who are furloughed or choosing to stay home because they're fearful of being sick. So anyone, any reduction in force, the minute they're not on your payroll anymore, or if they choose, and we're seeing a lot of this, a lot of folks are saying, you know, I just don't feel comfortable coming to work. And I understand that. I mean, I think we should all understand that. But there is nothing in the Families First Act that covers them. They would, after exhausting all PTO that would be available to them, they would be either furloughed or laid off, which is pretty much the same thing, and then they would uh, be eligible for unemployment. So unemployment is the remedy to deal with individuals who are laid off, furloughed, or who do not come to work because of that fear. Um, one other point on that, uh, if the, the, so the states, and I'm going to talk about unemployment in a minute, but the states maintain unemployment, and they have each have a variety of criteria that they use in order to qualify somebody as eligible for benefits. You may be in a state that will not allow somebody who, who, who intentionally um, chooses not to go to work. They may not be eligible for unemployment. Even if you don't contest it, you cannot guarantee they'll get benefits because those are administered by the state. So don't make any promises to folks uh, about getting unemployment if you suspect that your unemployment, your specific unemployment board within your state is more restrictive. <clears throat> uh, it doesn't cover any employees who are quarantined by employers. So let's say um, somebody's cousin that you were hanging out with then became sick with COVID and you've got an employee who went to dinner with them about two weeks ago and we want to have them stay home. It's not to say you shouldn't do that. I think that's fine to do that. It's always worth a conversation. But unless the quarantine is initiated either by a health professional or by a government um, saying that you have been exposed and need to be quarantined and self-isolated at home, unless it's a directive from a, hospital, or a health professional or a government, that's not paid. So if you send someone home, who would not otherwise be sent home because of a legitimate exposure. And again, the Centers for Disease Control is a great resource on that. Um, but if it's just your decision to send them home, it's not covered under this. If you unilaterally decide to send them home, I would recommend that you pay them because that's something that is not their fault and it's a decision that you've made. But again, this there's no hard and fast rule on this. <coughs> we have learned that um, it can be uh, taken intermittently, this, the, the, the family leave portion of it. If you're sick, if you have coronavirus and are sick, you cannot take that leave intermittently. The intermittent leave is really only, excuse me, <coughs> only for those, I'm sorry, I haven't been out of my house in 21 days, so I don't think I'm getting coronavirus, but now all of a sudden I can't stop coughing. Um, it can be taken intermittently for the care to take care of a child um, or to take care of somebody who is sick with coronavirus. But other than that, it, it's, it's only for those who are tending to children or, or those who are ill. It can be taken intermittently. So if, it, you, know, if you have a couple, they can maybe split the work um, that, that's, or, or split the day um, so that they can each get some work in. That's how intermittent leave would work. <clears throat> so the hours that they are working for you, they are at full pay, and the hours that they are taking leave is at two-thirds pay, up to the maximums that exist. Um, maintain documentation uh, for those that you have on leave. Um, so anybody who's taking leave, if they've got a doctor's note, explain in your documentation how and why you've initiated leave. An important thing to realize that a lot of these laws are, <clears throat> a lot of the components of this law they're up for you to decide. For example, um, the law provides that if you have fewer than 50 employees and providing this benefit would be a hardship, 
you do not have to provide this benefit. You can, you can claim a hardship waiver. And really, no one's going to be, you don't apply for that. You don't get a documentation certifying that. You simply make the case and hold on to it in case the Department of Labor pursues an investigation of your hardship claim. But you really have to prove a hardship claim. And, and these are only benefits that are offered to a very select type of person. So either they're taking care of their kids or they're sick with coronavirus, one of the two. And the fact that it's fully reimbursable on a number of levels means you really have to be walloped by this in order not to be able to afford it. So a lot of folks initially are like, this is going to put us under. But when you really look through it, it's really a small segment that are covered by this. Most people are not covered by this. So I would recommend if you're going to claim hardship, make sure you keep all of that documentation. Have your, your CPA and your attorney take a look at it to make sure it's kosher. Um, I will be putting forward a leave, a self-reporting leave request and documentation for you to use. Uh, we've been waiting from the Department of Labor uh, for it, but we haven't seen it. And I just came across a really great resource. So uh, keep an eye out on that on our site. We'll communicate it out to you. And of course, it'll be on your association site. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, keep going back to the U.S. Department of Labor the, just Google U.S. DOL and coronavirus. That's where all of the family first information resides. And they have a fact sheet for employees. They have a fact sheet for employers. They've got questions and answers. They've got the downloadable poster that you need to provide at your workforce and at your workplace and sent to all of your employees. A lot of your questions are going to be answered in there. So I strongly recommend that you keep checking that site. The IRS and the Treasury Department both have information on how you can um, uh, take those deductions in order to pay for any leave that you have covered and what that looks like and what documentation you need. So check those sites as well. They're really good resources. These are the sites that we're going to constantly. And of course, the Small Business Administration. This is a really, really important site for you, <clears throat> for the families first leave, but also and especially the CARES Act that I'm going to talk about now. So um, that's it for the family leave. Again, it, it goes into effect. The, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act goes into effect uh, as of today. And unfortunately, we are already working with our clients to help them um, work through administering that leave for folks who are falling ill. <clears throat> myself not included. All right, so the CARES Act. <laughs> this past Friday night, and I have been getting calls all night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday about this. You need to realize these are massive, massive bills that they're passing. And the, if you're frustrated because you're not getting enough information, it's because we're all still just figuring it out. It takes time to get the rules, to get those questions answered. <clears throat> what I'm gonna tell you about the CARES Act right now, and I'm gonna say it over and over and over again, I will answer what I can, but all of what's in the CARES Act, and the CARES Act has a bunch of buckets of money. I'm only gonna talk about a couple of them that I think apply most to my clients and to those of you on the phone, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. It is being administered through the Small Business Administration and your local, local lending institution. So those are the people to go to to answer your questions because those are the folks that are assessing whether you qualify and are administering the loans. So your sources of information are your bankers and your CPAs. That's who you need to be going to with questions. If you called them on Monday, they probably had no clue how to answer your questions because it just passed on Friday. So all of this is being rolled out. It's very ambitious. It's very fast. They are able to start taking applications as of Friday, this coming Friday. <clears throat> so we'll be learning more about it as we go along. My advice to you, if you're interested in this, and I do not know why you wouldn't be interested in this, apply, apply early because it is a set fund. So when that fund runs out, that money will no longer be available. So we should all be a little patient in learning the facts and getting enrolled in it. 
but we should do so within the next couple of weeks. I would not wait months if this is an important, you can, the program is, is open through till December, <clears throat> but I think a lot of folks are going to be applying for this. So for, under the CARES Act, for employers, there are a few pieces. There is the Paycheck Protection Loan. This is a loan that you take out from your local bank, um, and the loan is the equivalent of two and a half times your monthly average payroll. So average can be determined a number of different ways. It can be all of 2019. It can be the first quarter of 2020. There are a lot of different ways you can calculate average. But it's basically your average monthly payroll. So two and a half times your average monthly payroll up to $10 million maximum. I did hear a question about whether this was only for companies who had revenue of less than $7.5 million. I haven't seen that anywhere. I don't think that's a thing. So <clears throat> it's for businesses um, of up to 500. If you have up to 500 employees, this is a program that's available to you. The key to this benefit is that if you take out this loan, so let's pretend FAMO, today is the first, I got this bucket of money, and let's say it's, uh, it's $20,000. It's gonna cover two and a half times my payroll, and so that's $20,000, making it up. <clears throat> as long as in the eight weeks that follow today, so in the next eight weeks, as long as I use this money to pay payroll, at least 75% of that money I'm using to pay payroll, and then the other 25% I'm using for utilities and rent um, and any other operating expenses, as long as I keep my headcount constant and I keep my pay rate constant, so I keep everybody in place getting their money at the same rate as normal, that loan will be forgiven in full. That means it's just money to you. Now, if you've had to reduce the money, your, your, the what you pay, you will the forgiveness will decrease. Um, and uh, if you cannot keep, if you cannot maintain that workforce, um, the loan is a long, it's a long-term 10-year uh, loan with a maximum rate of 4%. So it's still a low, in, it's a low loan. But as, if the purpose of it is for you to either keep your level, your employment level constant, or if you've already had to lay employees off, bring them back. Or in some instances, if you have to lay folks off, after you've gotten a loan, if you bring them back within a certain set period of time, you will get that money forgiven. All of the details I do not have. I'm basically telling you what I know. Beyond that, you do need to go to your banker. They're the ones who are going to know this information. The CARES Act also has a refundable employee uh, retention credit. So this is basically for those companies who can demonstrate that they've had a pretty significant financial hardship a decline in gross receipts, or some other real business layoff that you can demonstrate, you can get up to 50% of wages, of each individual's wages, given to you as a credit, as, as, as a cash influx, up to a total of $5,000 per employee. So you can only count the first $10,000 of employee wages, and of that, you get 52% or 50% back. And this is basically those wages up for the second quarter of, um, or I guess it would be the first quarter of 2020, because <clears throat> we're not even in the second quarter yet. Oh, I guess we are today. Um, and it's regardless of business size. So uh, if you're much larger than 500 employees, you have to show significant financial hardship. The hardship threshold is less for smaller businesses, but you can get up to $5,000 per employee uh, as a cash credit. And you can also apply for an economic injury disaster loan or a loan advance. Again, these might be the things that you use to help pay in advance if you really do have a hardship by providing the um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, up to a total of $10,000 in total. It's just basically a really quick $10,000 cash advance to you. Um, you can't take out more than one of these things. So you have to pick and choose. And again, there are more. Talk to your, talk to your uh, banker about it and, and get their advice. i got to move along a little faster here. All right, for employees, uh, there's a stimulus payment that's going out. It's not really employees. It's basically all of us, every individual. If they were a taxpayer and they filed taxes within the last couple of years, you're eligible for up to $1,200 if you earned $75,000 or less, 
or if you earned around $99,000, between $75,000 and $99,000, you'll have a sliding scale of that value. Families can get up to $2,400 if they made between $150,000 or less. And again, uh, you can make up to $198,000 and still get some benefit, plus $500 per kid. This is rolling out on a case by case, or they're rolling out in the next few weeks, you can expect to see them and you'll probably get that money however you normally get your federal tax return. So if it's direct deposit into your bank account normally, that's how you will see this. There's nothing you have to do, you don't have to apply. As long as you pay taxes, this is coming to you. Um, they've also expanded <clears throat> unemployment benefits. And unemployment is a state benefit. The most the maximum weekly benefit most states have is around $400 to $500. Some are as high as $700 a week in, in unemployment benefits, some as low as $200. Whatever that is, the federal government's basically tacking another $600 onto that. So let's say you had an employee whose, whose maximum weekly benefit was $500. Going forward, their maximum weekly benefit on unemployment is going to be $1,100. That is for six weeks, for, for, I'm sorry, for four months, this $600 add-on will, will exist. Again, you still have to qualify for unemployment. So you still have to jump through whatever hoops your state establishes. But the federal government and the state are relaxing some of the requirements. For example, you don't want to force employees to have to look for five, five jobs a week when there are no jobs and they intend on working back for you once they can. Um, they've also extended the, the number of weeks you can be on unemployment. Most states, it's 26 weeks. That's been extended by 13 weeks, so up to 39 weeks you can get that benefit. Um, and then there's also a, a, a benefit for self-employed, gig-employed, freelance workers. They normally don't qualify for unemployment insurance, uh, but they will going forward if they are a gig employee or a freelancer, self-employed, they can get up to half of the normal state weekly maximum benefit. So in the previous example of $500, they'd be able to qualify for $250 plus $600. So really a good, a good safety net for those of you who have to lay off your employees, unfortunately. Resources for you to check on. Again, um, the Secretary of Treasury has assistance for small businesses, a lot of resources. I've been clicking through all of them. You can get a sample application, which I did get, and I've been reading through it to figure out what the fine print is, because I know you're going to ask me what the fine print is, and I wanted to have something to say other than call your banker, but that's really what I'm going to say anyway. Small Biz Business Administration, again, check that out. Okay. Just a couple more highlights before I take your questions. For those businesses that close, by and large, they're closing either because receipts are down or because of the closure um, as a result of these uh, mandatory stay in place uh, uh, location or, or orders that are being rolled out either on the state or local level. If you are fortunate enough to work in a company or own a company that is deemed essential, um, in order to validate that determination, your association is probably doing a lot of work to help you maintain that, diet, that designation. But in order to support that as well, I would check the CISA um, identifying uh, site that, that for this emergency, for this COVID emergency, what are the criteria that would cause you to be a, um, a, an essential business? Also, your state government orders will, will determine. In some places, I've seen car washes that are considered essential. In other places, they're not. I've seen attorney and lawyer uh, places be, be essential and then not. It's a mishmash all across the state. What I would recommend that you do, however, is once you have figured out your determination, if you are determining that you are an essential business, you need to provide that documentation to employees because we're seeing a lot of employees recently get pulled over on their way to work. Have that documentation. I know some folks are even creating badges that they wear their uniform to work and they have a badge that goes with it. If you've got branded branded clothing, have, that, have them wear that to work. Whatever you can to show that those employees are on their way to work and that your business is an essential business. Also, ensure that employees know and sign a policy that this designation of essential business only allows them to go to and from work. It does not give them the right to go, you know, four-wheeling for the, on the weekends with their, with their butts. 
So if they are caught misusing this release, this designation, they should be subjected to disciplinary action up to and including termination because you do not want to mess around with this. This is a very serious thing. And the last thing I would say is if you have customers that have questions, they may wonder, why are you open? What makes you essential? Some of us are slam dunks, you know, some of us are, are essential businesses that, um, you know, janitorial sector, right? You're cleaning the workplaces where, where uh, coronavirus is, it exists. That's an essential business. I think it would be hard to argue that that wouldn't be. But you know, a promotional products company or even a label or tag manufacturer, they may not be so, so, so readily essential. You don't want bad press. You don't want people saying, hey, how come you're open? We should all be doing our part. If we all did our part, we would get over this faster and you're not, so you're the problem. You wanna take this opportunity to explain how you are essential and how you're doing your part. So use this as a marketing effort because you wanna know you're not, that you're, you're, you want your customers and your communities to know that you are an essentially designated company and wear that with pride. Um, because otherwise you don't want to be uh, figured that people are, 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 are you're abusing that. For those that are still in operation, the CDC guideline is the most important thing for you. You need to maintain that you can, that you can socially distance, that you have uh, a clean office, that you're able to keep it sanitary. They are constantly updating these in, this information, the CDC guidelines. And here's what I want to share with you. Um, CDC guidelines say that those who have close contact with somebody who is a COVID exposed or COVID sick individual should self quarantine. So if you know my husband has COVID and, and you know we're living in the same house together, that employee should self quarantine. And if they can get a note from a doctor recommending that, that would be even more. But I think if they follow the CDC guidelines, they should be eligible under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Again, no direct no direct clarification on that, but if you're following CDC and that's what the government says you should do, and that is the situation that you have, as long as you can document that and keep that in your notes, I would, I would cover them under that act. For those who have home isolation, um, because they have COVID symptoms, they have COVID or COVID symptoms, some employees have, have all of the symptoms of COVID and their doctor has said, stay home, assume you have it. Some people have um, COVID symptoms and their doctors have evaluated them and said, you have it. For those folks who are on home isolation and have symptoms, they should be home for 72 hours after recovery, which is determined to be having no fever whatsoever without fever reducers and improvement in their respiratory symptoms, and at least seven days since the onset of the symptoms appeared. This is new guidance so this is what we should be using it used to be 24 hours after the fever broke no it's 72 hours after no fever with no fever reducer and improved respiratory symptoms those who have been tested so there are very few of us at that's this point who have been tested but those who have been tested can reduce can return again after the fever um, has subsided without the use of fever reduction and improvement in, of symptoms. And they've had two, pop, two negative subsequent tests within 24 hours. So if they were tested and deemed that they had it, they need to be tested for 42, for, with two times within 24 hours in order to be able to come back. Finally, if you have somebody who does get have, have exposure, confirmed to have exposure, Coordinate with your local health department in order to make sure you're able to uh, keep the, uh, the office as clean as possible. One other point I would make is that um, I forgot. Uh, coordinate with your local health. Oh, uh, do not let your employees know who it is who is COVID positive. You need to maintain their privacy through HIPAA as you normally would, but you do need to let them know that somebody has had exposure in the building and give them the I enough information to know how closely were they exposed, does their workplace exposed. Each one of these things is going to be different. We're going to be figuring it out as we go along. But the sources that I showed you, the CDC site, the, 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 the Department of Labor site, all of those are going to give you guidance on how to handle this as we go along. And again, we're getting answers every day because we're getting new questions every day because we're 
just getting into this now. And um, so keep in touch with all of those resources. Okay, so that was all that I had to um, yell at you about. Um, uh, while I wait for questions to be asked, please do reach out to us. We're happy to answer your questions. Paige also knows more than I do about everything, our website, and link in with me on LinkedIn. So Stephanie, what you got? Okay, so we have a few uh, open questions that we got during the webinar. We have a few emailed ones, so I'll go to the emailed ones first. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, is there, we've got a few things about self-employment. Is there anything um, that these um, acts and these new ordinances cover that cover, that uh, pertain to self-employed people? Yes, actually, the um, both the Payroll Protect Protection Act, you can apply to get two and a half times your, your income, your average monthly income reimbursed to you under the same terms as everybody else. So both the Payroll Protection Act covers you, as well as that expanded unemployment insurance benefit would cover you. So those are both benefits that are new for self-employed individuals. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, if uh, what is the difference between uh, Section 3102 Division C, the FMLA expansion? It indicates that employers are not required to pay employees for the first 10 days of a public health emergency. However, in Division E of the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, it indicates that full-time employees are entitled to 80 hours paid sick time, which is available immediately. Can you explain the difference? Okay, I do wish I was reading that. Um, that's a big one. <laughs> so under a health emergency, if that's a directive by the state to stay at home, so any state or local directives to remain in place or to stay at home, those are not covered. The quarantine to stay home is really for you as an individual because of your individual exposure. Either you were sick or you were exposed to somebody who was sick. If you were sick and you were exposed to somebody who was sick, you were covered for the sick leave provision of the Families First Act. Um, but if it's just everybody in Rockland County, New York, stay home um, you know, in order for, to protect public health, that is not covered. Anybody who closes down their business that can't work remotely under that would then be eligible under unemployment. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you've already covered this, correct? How does a small company apply to the uh, the department, the DOJ for exemption? Uh, it, Oh, for the exemption, for the okay. Department of Labor exemption for the Families First Coronavirus Response, you don't actually apply. In order to get an exemption, you collect all of the information that would show that you are a hardship. You can go to the IRS department or the Treasury department on, online on those sites to get the definition of what hardship means, how you would qualify for hardship, and then all you do is hold on to that. And then if you decide to do that and you don't cover those benefits and an employee turns you in to the State Department of Labor or the Federal Department of Labor, then the Department of Labor may decide to investigate you and your decision. And that, was, that is when those, that, those documents would become relevant. So you, you, you make that documentation and you save them in, ca in case the Department of Labor comes knocking on your door. Okay. Um, okay, so what's the difference between the economic injury disaster loan application that's currently available on the SBA website and the payroll protection program, and do we apply for both? So you don't apply for both. You apply for one or the other. The Economic Injury Act, that provides up to, I believe that's the one that provides up to 50% of the first $10,000 of your wages. Um, that's a faster uh, there's, that's a faster application. Um, so that that's more of a cash infusion. Um, and then the other one is is a, is a longer benefit, and for that you have to maintain your workforce, so you have more strings attached. You need to talk to your banker about your specific situation, and they will be the ones to determine which of these different loans, which of these different grants, which of these credits are are, be are best for you and your individual situation. Okay. Um, are there any benefits for sole proprietors? Yes, it's the same as what I just said for, for, um, for self-practitioners. That sole proprietors, freelance employees, gig workers, um, they're all covered under this. 
Okay. All right. So that's the end of the email. So the live ones, uh, well, that was one that was just answered. Um, does the average monthly payroll include payments made to owners of an LLC? Yes, if the owners are part of that LLC, yes, as, but only up to the first, uh, first $100,000. So if the, if the owner gets paid $120,000, the payroll would include that first $100,000 and not the 20 above. Okay. But otherwise, they would be included with the rest of payroll. Got it. Um, so for the payroll protection loan, how are full-time employees calculated? Which date would be used? So I would encourage you to go on to the site because there's a lot of question and answer on how to calculate full time. And <clears throat> the one that I've seen the most frequently referred to is the average over 2019. Um, but if you've had significant changes or you know a, a very big difference in, in your operations since that or within this first quarter prior to COVID, um, you can make that determination. And again, that's something that you should sit down and talk to your banker about. I would look at all those numbers and figure out which one is the most advantageous for you. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, sorry, I'm trying to make sure, I'm trying to make You're sure I'm not asking the same question twice uh, in a different way. Um, <laughs> do we continue to deduct garnishments from paychecks during this time? That's a really great question. I would treat it the same way you would somebody who's out on PTO. Okay. So yes. Okay. Um, uh, just to clarify, because this question's come up in a, a couple of different ways, um, if an employee has a doctor's note saying they're staying to stay home due to compromised immune system, they have no exposure, but they don't have COVID-19, do they only get the 80 hours? Um, they would, under any circumstances, only get the 80 hours. The only one who gets the extended 12 weeks of leave are for those who are home with their children. No one else is covered under that. Now, the person who is home with the compromised immune system, if they work for a company that has more than 50 employees, they could then be covered under regular family leave. They wouldn't be paid, but they could be covered under that. And again, if you have somebody like that, you maybe have one out of 30 employees is like that, you may want to extend a, a unique PTO benefit to them because of their specific circumstances. Maybe you want to put in place a new PTO pool that folks can donate time to them. You can be creative in how you handle some of these specific circumstances. But what, when we're talking about the Families First Act, we're really only talking about what the federal government will reimburse. So the, these are only things that the government will reimburse. But you're free to add more to that if you can. And that's why these payroll protection acts and, and, and components under the CARES Act exist because they will give you the resources to be able to do things like this for specific individuals who are uniquely impacted compared to others. Got it. Okay. So regarding reimbursement, um, is, is a business able to deduct the total of all of the three plans paid out each time they submit payroll taxes? And is it gross to cover them? Or is it gross just to make sure that it's reimbursed to a reimbursement account? Oh, I think I did not understand a single word of that. Can you say that again? Yes. So regarding reimbursement, um, if a business is able to deduct, like our business will be able to deduct the total of all of the three plans paid out each time we submit payroll tax deposits, correct? Deduct and each of the three plans. I don't even know what three plans we're talking about. The, the different components under the CARES Act, is that what yes. you're talking about? Yes, I'm pretty sure that's what it means. Well, they can only, they can only apply for one. They have to choose. Got it. Okay. So then if they can only choose one, then would it be gross to cover the taxes or is it just to, if it, like, is it just, do you, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to like translate it. At the You're same doing time. a great job. I, 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 I give you, I give you A's for even trying to figure it out because you like figure it out. I still have to figure it out. Okay. I'm doing my best. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah. So is it, are you able to deduct the total of a plan that you pick um, every time that you submit the payroll tax deposit? It sounds like a... Account. Oh, I think they're talking about the family leave. Yes, yeah. you're going to submit the gross of everything that you paid out to that individual who is covered under that leave. Yes, okay. So if I go out on leave, either sick leave, uh, you know, for at full pay, or sick leave at partial pay to take care of somebody, or family leave, got it, family leave uh, for the 12 weeks to take care of individuals, yes. You're going to calculate, you're going to code in your payroll system 
all of the pay that you gave to that person under that leave, and all of that, the total of that is what you're going to deduct, correct? Got it. Gross. Okay. They asked gross. So yeah. will they deduct the taxes that they would pay on that? Um, I don't believe you deduct the taxes because you're not paying taxes on it. Okay. You're not paying taxes on leave that you are offering under the Families First Act. Those, that, that, that benefit is not taxed because it's 100% reimbursed by the government. So you would not deduct taxes because you're not paying taxes on it. Okay. Okay. Um, that hurt my head. You did. You did it. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question about an employee with multiple um, employee with multiple streams of income. So if there's an employee who's a full time employee but has uh, self employment through uh, their own business, uh, do can they still qualify for unemployment for their self employment um, income? Yeah, so they should talk to their, every state has a different rule on this. Some states um, allow, if you have multiple jobs and, and you get laid off in one job, you can, you can apply for partial unemployment. And if you apply for partial unemployment, you would get the $600 on top of it. And let me be clear, there are many circumstances where folks are going to apply for this unemployment benefit and end up getting more money under this unemployment benefit that they would normally at work. Uh, this benefit is equates to $15 an hour in addition to what their normal hourly rate. So you can expect that people are going to make more money on this than, um, than otherwise. But it's a short-term emergency, let's just get through this kind of thing. And again, if there's a work available for them and it's time for them to go back to work and their employer has recalled them, their benefits would cease under most circumstances depending on how your state manages that. Okay. Um... Another a question about people being out sick. Um, ooh, since the uh, since it is not retroactive, um, the the act is not retroactive and it's gone. It's uh, it is now in effect starting today. If they are already out sick and they will be out for an additional ten days, can the benefits start today? Yeah, the de benefits definitely will start today. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Just to reiterate, the Paycheck Protection Program helps with payroll for full-time and part-time employees? Yes, total payroll. Yep. Got it. Um, do we, uh, just want to make sure that this was covered or if it wasn't. Um, since the Payroll Protection Program can be applied for on Friday at 9 a.m., when will the CARES Act be available for application? That, the, the Payroll Protection Act is a component of the CARES Act. So the CARES Act has a bunch of specific loans and grants under it. So those are the ones that are going to be accepting applications. And if, if you look, um, if you print out the application, which you can get on the Department of, uh, on the Treasury Department site, um, it asks which one of these you're applying for. So, you, you, so they're, they're all part of the CARES Act. So basically you're applying for a component of the CARES Act on Friday. Okay. Uh, does the Paycheck Protection Loan cover uh, only wages, or does it also cover medical premiums and 401k matches and benefits like that? Uh, so it covers payroll um, for the calculation. It can be used to pay out on health insurance. Um, I believe, actually, it is calculated in the payroll. So if, when you run payroll, those amounts are included, the loan would be based on that, but that's what the loan is based on, but you can use that loan to pay for also rent or mortgage uh, interest and um, utilities and, and other things other than payroll, but 75% of the loan has to be paid out in payroll for it to qualify for, for um, forgiveness. Okay. Um, and okay. again, talk to your banker. I mean, I'm answering these questions. I shouldn't answer any because I, 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 the only thing I know is what I've been reading. Um, so I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not privy to any additional information than just kind of what's out there and what I've learned through interpretation. But I'm not your best source for anything under the CARES Act, I'm afraid, other than just making you aware of it. Okay. 
Um, all right, I'm trying to make sure we don't have any more duplicates. Um, so, uh, is an S corp is an S corp or LLC LLC eligible? Yes. Great. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. And um, <clears throat> we covered deductions and uh, oh, just to just to because these are federal deductions. Um, do in regards to reimbursement, do you get to deduct the employer's matching part of FICA and Medicare? Under the payroll, under the, the under the <laughs> under the um, F, FMLA, under the sick leave. Um, I guess so. Do you get to deduct the employer's part? I don't think it changes the deduction. It doesn't change your deduction for what you're paying that is covered that is not covered by Families First. But anything that you pay when you're on Families First. Um, which includes pay and health insurance. It does not include 401k or other things. Any of that, um, you're, you're, you're not deducting it because you're getting reimbursed uh, in full for it. So you can't take a deduction on something you're getting reimbursed by. But they're not going to reimburse things beyond, I believe, beyond health insurance and, and pay. Okay. Um... Just to reiterate, because I believe you mentioned this um, during the presentation, but just in case people missed it, um, how many weeks does a company have to pay an employee who's diagnosed with COVID-19 when they are out of work? You don't have to pay an employee anything if they're out of work. Okay. So COVID-19, <coughs> excuse me, the Families First Act only covers employees who are, are off sick from work because they're sick and they only are eligible for up to 10 days paid under the families first. You can use PTO to expend, extend that, of course, but the federal program is only 10 days for those who are sick, but only those employees who are actively at work. Once you've laid somebody off, once somebody is not at work, they're not covered under these under anything under the families first act. Okay. Um, do you know what the guidelines are for averaging payroll? To use the date savage payroll, excuse me? Um, well, there's again, there's a variety of ones, and that's why I would have you um, go on and look. I've seen, you know, 2019, January 1st to December 31st averaging. I've seen quarters in terms of the dates, but I, I would go and decide which one. I would pull, I would see what the date ranges are that they allow and pull all of that and then sit down with your banker and figure out which one is a better determinant for you. Okay. Um, and again, don't take my advice. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and so another paycheck question. When, uh, for the Paycheck Protection Loan, when it says 2.5 times the payroll, is that, is that determined by the frequency um, of payroll, weekly or biweekly or so forth? Um, it's two and a half months. Hmm. It's not, it has nothing to do with pay period. It's okay. two and a half months. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, these both sound like, oh, here's a, a, a question about uh, informing employees. Are we legally obligated to email the FFCR flyer to employees? You're not legally obligated to, to email it to them. You just have to make sure that they get it. So if your workplace is still open, you can post it. I would add it in the pay stubs that folks get if they get direct deposits. If you're closed down like most of us, I would email it or put it on the, the portal. Um, the, the point is to, to, to let them know what, what's in it. And, and one important point on that, employees are going to be shocked what's not in it. Employees are going to be shocked that um, that those who have coronavirus don't get any extended leave. Um, that 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 extended leave only covers those who are home with children. Uh, that they'll be they'll be surprised to realize that um, if they don't, you know, if they're sick but haven't been diagnosed with COVID, if it's just their choice, they may not be covered. There are a lot people are expecting this to be much more comprehensive than it really is. So. I, I think it's an opportunity for you to tell them what your your requirements are under the law 
But if you're going to be going above and beyond, this is a great time to, to tell them that, to tell them that you're there for them and that you care for them and you're going to try to do as much for them as you can. Okay. Um, and then one thing about the Families, uh, families uh, Act, if an employee has to stay home while being diagnosed, their spouse is also home, um, how is the spouse covered under the Response Act? Is that, the, is that your, as the employer's responsibility, or the spouse's employer's responsibility? No, if your employee is homesick and you're covering them, the, the, the spouse's quarantine requirements would fall under their employer's legal obligation. So you're never under any of these responsible for the, the pay or the leave of somebody who's not your employee. Okay, okay. That is, that is the top of the hour. We do have some questions left over, but I can send those to you. That would be great. I'd be happy. Last time I, I, uh, I went through them and um, I did a, a quick little video answering those questions. That video came out on Monday, so there's some questions and answers in there. Very little on CARES because it hadn't been enacted yet. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy to take those and, and do that again and, and shoot a little video finishing up these questions and answers. Okay. All right. Well, then I'd like to give a big thank you to uh, Claudia today. Before leaving, we would like to gather your feedback on today's webinar content. Please take a moment to respond to the poll questions on your screen. We will be following up with a recording of today's program. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all. I hope you all remain safe and healthy, and if we can do anything to help, don't hesitate to let us know. All the best.